this lecture and the next introduce this notion of um, measurement. You might call it measurement theory for classical nonlinear systems. Uh, I mentioned there are two interactive labs up on the Sage server that parallel um, some of the demonstrations and constructions here. So definitely uh, play with those. See if you have any questions that come up from that. Um, so wh wh what do we mean by, by measurement? So here's kind of a cartoon picture of this, a little more detailed picture of our roadmap. Um, so here is Mother Nature in all of her high dimensional but hidden and mysterious glory. Bristler tractor standing in for her. And uh, we have this sort of conception that at each moment in time, the system is in some configuration and over the next instant in time, if it's thinking of continuous time, the state evolves. So it's just out there roving away. And then our interface to, to nature is through some kind of device, call it an instrument. And there are a couple fairly basic things about instruments. One is that you choose some number of probes. And even this question is a complicated question um, in some experimental settings. Um, if you were, for example, a hydrodynamicist studying fluid turbulence and you have your wind tunnel or your fluid flow chamber, how many probes are you going to put in there? Um, if it's very turbulent and different parts of the fluid are active, putting in just a single probe to measure the velocity at a point, kind of intuitively it's going to be throwing a lot of information away. But then carpeting the experiment with a bunch of probes, well, that might get you more data, but you have so much instrumentation in the fluid, it affects the flow. So that's just one kind of non-triviality of designing good instruments. So we're going to talk about, again, a very kind of simplified setting um, where we can talk about good instrumentation and bad instrumentation. Um, and there's some very kind of surprising results in this. So, so even choosing the number of probes, and what does that mean? It means whatever the, 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 the physical, bi chemical, biological, social system out here, when you fix some number of probes, you're projecting whatever that state space is down onto some subspace, the dimension of which is the number of probes you have. I'm kind of imagining these probes are scalar. Like in the case of fluid turbulence, people for many years used what are called hot wire anemometers. Anemometer like wind vane, just, just a wire with the current going through it, and the faster the fluid goes by, the more heat it takes away, and that affects the resistance. Very basic. So, but that would be just the <clears throat> velocity at a point. And even then, it wouldn't necessarily give you the direction. So, so there are modifications of that. So anyway, so you, have, so you project this unknown, possibly very high dimensional state space down to some measurement subspace. And then, of course, any instrument is going to have some effective resolution. And in this cartoon picture, we just kind of imagine that that's parameterized uniformly by some epsilon. You know, these days, the main way we have of interfacing to signals is through uh, analog to digital converters. That's how our music boxes work. Um, in any case, each dimension of this projected subspace is coarse grained in terms of the resolution. Uh, what I don't have depicted here is the time resolution. You also there's sampling frequency. How often do I make a measurement? <clears throat> So what, so, so what is a measurement? With this setup, what is a measurement? Well, system sort of rolling around and somehow you or some clock in this device says, where are you? And it says, oh, oh, the system state projects onto this cell. So literally what the measurement is, is the label for the cell. Just information. It's not volts or fluid velocity or something like that. It's just a label. The interpretation of the label as being having some units comes from the subspace in which probes you chose. So over time, you end up with in cell 17, cell 132, cell 1, cell 5, cell 1023. You get this time series. And then I'm just going to, for the sake of simplicity, <clears throat> just imagine we take this so epsilon to the minus d possible cells indices, and I'm just going to code them into 
binary integers, so that the net output from this so-called instrument is just this time series of binary integers. Okay, very mundane, prosaic. Give me a me measurement and it comes back and says 1101. That's the cell you're in. And the question, of course, is what can you learn from that? How much of, what would be the questions? Well, one, one would be, can you even see <laughs> that you have uh, a certain number of probes? I guess you kind of know that, so that's a moot point. Uh, but then what's the effective dimension of, of the dynamical system that we're observing, this hidden dynamical system? So that's the problem of measurement theory. How much information is encoded in these binary strings about what's going on here? The dimension of the state space, the um, apparent randomness. Um, could we even infer that uh, after you get the dimension of the state space, that um, the system is governed by the Rusler differential equations, actually extract the symbolic form of the differential equations. It's plausible, right? If we can detect what these states are, <clears throat> then we can look at how the states get mapped from one sample time to another. And if that's a fine enough time resolution, you can imagine you're approximating the vector field. If you can approximate the vector field, you can ask, is there a functional form to that vector field? And that, in effect, would be the differential equation. So there's some possibility there. So this all kind of rests on, um, in a way, what we've done so far, which is just appreciating that although these this series of measurements could appear very noisy, sound noisy, look noisy in Fourier transforms and power spectra, uh, fill out continuous probability distributions. Because we've worked with a number of low-dimensional examples, we kind of know that there might be some simple hidden mechanism that's deterministic chaotic. So that's, that's a cause for hope. Whenever you're confronted with something, before you know the physics or biology or chemistry or whatever of it, and it looks noisy, there might be some chaotic dynamical system hidden there. So that was it's kind of the story of probably the all of the decade of the 1980s and part of the 90s is trying to figure out how to do this reconstruction. So people even took it down to trying to extract the equations of motion, the differential equation from a time series. So, okay, so that's kind of the overall picture. Now we're going to get much more uh, <clears throat> practical about this. So, so how, how, what concepts and mathematical foundations do we need to, to talk about this? So that's what this lecture is about. <clears throat> and I'm introducing what is called in, more typically, it's called symbolic dynamics. Typically thought of as being part of dynamical systems theory, um, but looking at the dynamics over symbol systems, like zeros and ones or strings of zeros and ones. So, so, I, so I just posed this, this problem for hidden dynamical systems. What can we learn from this discrete time series? Now, nobody really objected to my ending up with this time series of bits, even though this was continuous time. So that, that's even a question. Is continuous time reflected in that? Um, you know, can, from a discrete time series, can we learn that actually the underlying system is continuous time? Or that the uh, probes are actually continuous variables, not discrete valued variables? What would be the properties of a discrete time series that would let you learn that? <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> now j just just to, to just to point out that there's actually a lot of uh, um, uniformity to how we're approaching these questions. So far, right, the first few weeks we were talking about dynamical systems, and without really acknowledging it, there was an assumption that we had a point in some continuous state space, and either over continuous time or over discrete time, there was some rule, the dynamic, that took this infinitely precise point to another infinitely precise point the next time. Uh, more recently, we've been talking about just how the notions of probability theory and statistics come into play to describe chaotic systems. And we sort of see that chaotic systems produce distributions. So we were talking about in the last couple lectures how to start with some initial distribution and how to think about how this dynamic maps that distribution forward in time. So what we're going to do today can be said very simply. <clears throat> 
what we're going to do is actually see how the dynamic evolves cell boundaries. So there's a little bit of a lesson here. One of the ways you study complicated systems is you sort of throw different dimensional objects at them. Points, functions, and now boundaries between these measurement cells. <clears throat> okay, so the construction is a little surprising, I think, at first blush. So what I'm going to do is tell you what the construction is, then give you the kind of mathematical underpinnings, and then I'm going to come back and re-explain it to you. So I'll come back to this, but let me just say in words what we're going to do. So here's our friend, the logistic map in green, right? Some map of the interval unto itself. <clears throat> and for whatever uh, reason, I've decided, maybe I'm just too cheap, I'm just going to get a binary measuring instrument. And what this binary measuring instrument does, there's a, a decision point, I'll call that D. It's a point on the interval such that when, say, x at time t falls below that decision point, the instrument outputs a zero. When it falls above, the instrument outputs a one. So I'm just sort of drawing that. Whenever the, the x values land in this half interval, a zero comes out, and when it lands up here, a one comes out. <clears throat> so the entire exercise of figuring this out is Imagine I give you some binary sequence from this that corresponds to x0, x1, x2, some trajectory over the integers. So right, and then where could it have come from? Okay, so so far, if, if I tell you one, where's the state? Right, on the upper, zero, okay. So the questions are actually just that simple, except it's a nonlinear map, so they get a little subtle and kind of fun. So let's imagine that we're gonna make Two measurements. Again, the instrument's just saying above or below D, 0, 1, 0, 0, whatever, as X is bouncing around. So now the question is, <clears throat> what set of initial conditions could have produced the sequence 0, 0? So the graphic is showing you the construction. Well, it's pretty easy. We just answered half of the question because if you see a 0, you know it's in this lower half. Okay, so we at least have to produce that. Now, the next symbol is a zero. So what subset of this lower half interval could produce a zero? So I'm starting here. What iterates here produce a zero? Well, that's this interval here that maps up to between zero and a half, zero to D. So I infer that this set of initial conditions, starting anywhere there, they're going to that set will produce the sequence 0, 0. Similarly, if I said 0, 1, what points? Well, it's going to be in this interval, but then it's going to be this subset that maps up to 1. 1, 1? Well, there's actually, they're actually not kind of increasing monotonically or numerically. 1, 1, I start up in one interval, and then this subset of it maps to 1. And then finally up here, I had a 1 and then a 0. Now how am I deciding this? Notice that I put D up here, this decision point. And actually for this example, I'm putting D at a half. This is <laughs> at the logistic map. Uh, X equal half is a very important point. So what I'm doing to find this boundary between where the initial conditions that started in the 0 subinterval map into each other, that is actually where the map crosses a half, maps to a half. Or the other way we say that is we look at D in the range of the function and look at what points could map to it. And there are two points, here and here. The in forward iterates map to this. Or the other way we say it is that F inverse of D is these two points. Again, we're just, we're just answering this really simple question. Okay, what about uh, zero, zero, zero? So now I plot f squared, and I do the same construction. I just note where f squared crosses d, and I draw these, identify these inverse iterates, and you can see how that's calculating. So 0, 0, 0 corresponds to 0, and then 0, and then 0. It's this little piece down here. Everything starting here stays for, for two more steps on the 0 side. The instrument reports 0. It gets a little more complicated down here to actually see what's going on. So now 1, 1, 1 starts in 1, maps into this, and then there's a small piece here that 
and it helps to draw f cubed to, uh, f squared because I can see that it maps above d. So that's going to be one. <clears throat> so part of the construction, I'm thinking about how the sequence are going forward in time, but the way I'm answering the question is trying to, in a sense, retrodict what initial conditions could have produced that. So I'm looking at, in a sense, the, the inverse of the decision point. It's the original decision point D. So you can kind of see what's happening here, I hope. So the real nice uh, uh, result is that if the map has slopes greater than one and is chaotic, then as I look at longer and longer sequences, to the same extent that the map was unstable in the forward direction, when I reverse, can look at reverse time, it's exponentially contracting, which means the size of these intervals exponentially goes to zero as I go to longer and longer sequences. So that when I look at infinitely long sequences, there's essentially one-to-one -one mapping with the points on the interval. I have a complete code. Right, so I'm not pulling a fast one here. You might say, well, wait a minute, those are discrete binary sequences. Those are finite in number. And we had a continuum interval. You've kind of thrown something, but it's no, no. We're looking at, it's true, the x values are on a continuum, but we're looking at infinite binary strings. And infinite binary strings as a set have the same cardinality as the unit interval, points on the unit interval. So what distinguishes this particular matching of binary sequences to points on the interval from the natural one of this writing database too? Ah, good question. Uh, we will come to that. Okay. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. Um, well, okay, so you might, uh, you, could, you could kind of think of, uh, right now, the way I've set it up is that that uh, logistic map, iterating logistic map on some initial condition x0, it's kind of like an encoder. I can trap 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and it's kind of like unpacking the bits in some way uh, of the initial condition. If I think of the initial condition in its own binary sequence. So it turns out it's non-trivial here because... I have these two monotone pieces, and this one has negative slope. So when I look at the codes, imagine these were numbers. 0, 1, 3, 2, 5. It's not monotonic. I mean, you actually can guess what map would make it monotonic. Shift map. Right, the shift map exactly unpacks the digits of the initial condition in order. So any deviation from that is actually just going to start telling you something interesting about how the logistic map deviates from this kind of trivial shift map. Even though the shift map is kind of this canonical example of chaos. The logistic map, the tent map, um, we'll, we'll go through this, uh, uh, also is slightly different because the shift map has two positive slope pieces. It has one, the tent map has one uh, piece monotone piece that's negative, and that kind of shuffles the bits around. So there's a lot of, in some sense, information in the output binary sequence that's telling you some of the features of the nonlinear map. Mm -hmm. So are the bit sequences actually uncountably infinite? Yeah. Yeah, infinite sequences are, yeah. OK, so, so, so how are we going to set this up? Sort of formally, just some kind of definitions and then we'll come back to that construction again. I'll just go through it again, and then we'll go through examples. Logistic map, tent map, shift map. Okay, so again, so, 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 so the, the goal of the mathematics is to ask, um, what are the conditions such that the output binary sequence is of some, some, some sort of faithful representation of the iterates on the interval? I mean, for example, I mean, I'm calling this the decision point D down here ahead of time, maybe I don't know actually what the shape of the map is. When I put D up here, so zero is you know, below two thirds, or X is below two thirds correspond to zero, and X is above correspond to one. Is that a good code? I don't know, what, and what are the criteria? So that, that's, that's what we need to set up here. Okay, so, so we just some definition. So we have, first of all, we'll think about just dis discrete time uh, maps here. Um, continuous maps are a little more complicated. 
it's easier to think in discrete time, and mostly we'll talk about one and two-dimensional maps of the plane. So we have our space of states, and then some mapping F takes present state to the next one. And then our measuring instrument is some kind of partition. And that's just a set of sub-intervals or cells in the, sta in the state space, some finite set, such that when you union them all up, they are the original state space. There aren't holes. And then they don't overlap. They're intersections, except when the same are null. So that's the definition of a partition. And then we also need to think about, imagine we have two partitions. In fact, the construction I just did when we went from f to f squared, uh, we were actually comparing partitions um, from different iterates and actually looking at the, the, the uh, what's called the refinement of them. So the idea is if I have two partitions, you can imagine like time one and time two in the previous construction, uh, you can form the refinement, this wedge here, and it's just all intersections of the cells in the two partitions. Finer. Finer partition. And you should just convince yourself that this refinement the elements of this refinement also are a partition. Okay, so the measurement symbols, well, this is kind of completing the design of the instrument. So imagine that, that the, the state of the system is in some cell, and we just have this operator that, oh, if I'm in cell I, I'm going to output some symbol. You know, it could be we have a digital multimeter, and the symbols are volts or something like that, or it could just be zeros and ones, or we'd be looking at a statistical mechanical system where the spins are up and down. Anyway, most people think about finite setup partitions, therefore we'll have a finite measurement alphabet. So A. Then sort of more directly, we'll denote that by this operator, pi. So I plug in a state, and it returns the symbol. So, we have an orbit here back in the, for the dynamical system, initial condition, iterated along, and then we end up with this measurement sequence, which here I denote the orbit as a vector, that whole semi-infinite sequence, and we can apply that component-wise, the pi operator component-wise, to get the symbol sequence, also in bold here. So that's just this symbol sequence such that for every iterate of x, I end up with a corresponding symbol, simple enough. So we've been thinking about state space, but also orbit space, right? Where we imagine we have this cross product between, you know, the state space of time t, t plus one, t plus two, and we have this corresponding sequence space, which is just this infinite or bi-infinite chain, depending upon the setting of the alphabet, <clears throat> samples from the alphabet. And then the question is, oh, well, up here we're familiar with this. We have a state space that gets mapped to itself by some dynamic f. What's the corresponding dynamic over sequence space? And this is sort of the main simplification we get from going to the to symbols. The dyna dynamic over sequence space is this what we, shift operator. It's kind of trivial. So if I have some particular infinite sequence s, I apply this operator, shift operator sigma, it gives me a new infinite sequence where the time indices are all shifted by one. So one, zero, one, 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 shift once in time. And that will be a new point on the interval, correspond to a new point on the interval. Again, yeah, so right, so we're sort of hopping right state to state to state. <laughs> and then, uh, but for every state, it's represented now by a sequence, this long sequence. So we end up with this maybe very complicated f, quadratic function, sine function, something like that. But in sequence space, it's trivial. It's just take the sequence you've got, which corresponds to one point here at time t, and oh, I want to know where I go at time t plus one. Well, that's just shifting the sequence once. The dynamic is completely trivial, just shifting its time origin. In a sense, what we've done is take all that sort of complicated, a lot of the complicated structure in this smooth nonlinear dynamical system it's dynamic f, and it's all now encoded in the sequence. What sequences can occur? So just so I make sure I know what's going on here, the, in our logistic map example, that script A 
measurement alphabet, uh -huh. everything in that is an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. Script. Uh, so the, uh, sorry. So the, so so the, so the infinite sequence, the set of infinite sequences is this product of the alphabet at each time. Okay. So that's, and I call that sigma. Right. Right. So that's the set of either one-sided infinite or two-sided infinite sequences, depending upon which okay. kind and of map you're using. Each but. entry of sigma is from A. Right. Each. We'll, we'll get to that shortly. Yes, we'll get to exactly that construction. So I'm just kind of setting things up, and, and then it's like, okay, get me back to the interval quickly. I'm getting lost. Right. So, so right. So, so in a sense, points here are infinite sequences, and if we have a good instrument, then those correspond to points on the interval. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so on the previous slide, the shift map. It looks like you're moving it backwards in time because of the way you're shifting. So what's kind of Going on oh, there. um. So it looks like you're shifting to the oh, right. left instead of to the right. Yeah, it depends on how you set it up. Um, it, as long as it, it, it's a shift, that's fine. Okay. So we, we just have to agree where the direction of time is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. No, no, no. Okay. no. Yeah. I think, I think you have it written down that S0 goes to S1, but then Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. So I should probably, yeah. So it's technically both. Okay. Yeah. Imagine I wrote it out this way, it's shifting this way. But so the, the oh. next time would be the S prime, correct? Like S prime. Yeah. Like yes, same. right. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll do this for some of the examples. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about. Somehow we've bought into this construction that we can just kind of look at the set of sequences that occur that the map generates. So that's going to be the set of, of the set of sequences that do occur. Do occur. So it's called admissible sequences. We, it's not the full space of sequences. It could be some subset. So we say sigma for the corresponding map, and that's just all the iterates from the initial conditions on the interval that fall in some partition element. And it's a, a subset of the original space. But there can be restrictions, like we'll see. It can be the structure of the map is such that a zero cannot follow a zero. And that would then cleave out a whole set of sequences from the full shift space. We'd have a subset there. Um, also, then the other thing is if, imagine back uh, for, for the dynamical system, we have some invariant set that's in, invariant specifically under F, the attractors say, for the logistic map or shift map. Then if you start with an initial condition in that invariant set, then you can show, we're not going to do the proofs here, that this set of admissible sequences is also shift invariant and closed. Which, you know, we're trying to argue that there's a mapping between points on the interval and these sequences, so these very coarse properties had better be maintained, so it's true. So set of states invariant under F leads to a set of sequences that's invariant under the shift map. Shift operator, sorry. Okay. So the net thing we've done is just by starting with this very crude measuring instrument, we've ended up with another kind of dynamical system, a symbolic dynamical system, under our particular choice of where the decision point was or where, how we're breaking, discretizing or breaking the continuous state space into cells. So that's a choice of instrument. But under that choice, we end up with this so-called subshift, where we have a state space and a dynamic. So it's a dynamical system in a loose sense. Could you, could you, I'm not sure that I understand what the shift is supposed to represent. Is that evolution in time or? Yes, evolution in time. Okay. Right. And so our, you imagine that zero is your, where you are at present? Right. Okay. Right. cleaned up too well. Right, the idea is we have our initial condition that gets iterated. <clears throat> and then this might correspond to 
and I'll, I'll put in a binary point, so 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, like that. And then this guy would correspond to 1, 0, 1. It's just shifted over, like that. So, so because we want, we want to translate dynamics from yes. the continuous layer right. to the... Right. 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 So literally, this dynamical system is taking a whole infinite sequence to another one. But in a funny way, just think of one realization, and it's like shifting the binary point, the origin of time, down. So, good. Uh, right. So we can ask um, if I have a symbol sequence. This is getting back to the construction. What cell? What region of the state space does that correspond to? Or said another way, what set of initial conditions could have produced that sequence? Right. And the construction I gave graphically, but the logistic map is equivalent to this. Basically, you look at the iterates of these partition elements, inverse iterates of that. Or even more simply, like in the construction of the example, we just iterate the boundaries and follow those back in time. So, so the answer is, it's that set, the set of initial conditions that could produce that sequence correspond to all of the intersections of the cells that could have been visited in reverse time. Right, I'm kind of, oh, how can I produce this sequence? And then I, I go back this way and look at the inverse iterates. And then there's this notion of, of um, when I look at a particular sequence that's allowed, say admissible. Um, really what we're talking about is this infinite sequences. So when I look at a particular word and I'm asking about what region of initial condition could have produced that, there's a whole other set of simple sequences that share that word, but could be other things outside of that. And that's this notion of a cylinder. And the picture here is that if I had some particular sequence, so sort of over back in the state space, we kind of imagine there are a bunch of orbits coming in, but then they all, at least for some window, hop along the same set of partition elements. They kind of co-travelers for a while. And their itinerary is just that in indicated by that series of symbols or that series going back to the partition elements. So there's another way of saying that that yeah. Yeah. they get close in the state space. They don't have to be the same. Yeah. Again, right. I mean, again, and this is not so unfamiliar. Think of the Rustler attractor again whole set of points, but they do, there is recurrence, so they, they, they'll come back and they'll kind of track each other for a while, but then they'll diverge again and they'll wander around and they'll come back close again. So, so just to kind of, I'm just trying to give a picture of this kind of shared, temporarily shared life. <laughs> so when I, when, when we kind of shift back and forth, I mean, actually, you're, when you talk about the symbolic dynamic system, you're, you're, this, you're really talking about infinite sequences, but in fact, what you're going to hear me say is, oh, 101, which is a finite word. What am I talking about in terms of the real dynamic system? It's all of the sequences that share 101, say, at time 1, time 3, and all the other symbols, whatever. So, okay, just like candy, thing to just say, oh, that word. So, 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 if, and if you look at all the words of length L that are allowed, that actually forms a partition, which is, uh, you can show that it's, each of these is a subset of the, of the admissible sequences, and then they actually partition that space. So. Right, so then we can go from talking about the point in the state space that corresponds to an infinite sequence, we can then use the cylinder construction to talk about that set of points that have the same word for some finite time L. In other words, they all kind of stay close to some sort of reference trajectory that has that simple sequence. Yeah? That's, that's, uh, we did not take the infinite intersection. Yeah. Yes, yes, right. I, I, I should have read that. You just get the right. 
Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm fudging just a little bit since you brought that up. Right. So, so this would just be with L here. Okay. I, sh I probably should write that down. Um, also, I'm kind of fudging when I talk about this one-to-one -one correspondence. As points get close to these boundaries between the cells, there can be a finite-to-oneness association between a symbol sequence and points in the interval. So, but let's just forget that. It's kind of like in the decimal, right, we have numbers on the interval, the real line, except in the decimal notation, many of them have two symbolic representations. We already ran across this when we were talking about how to simulate the, the shift map. 2.0 is the same thing as 1.999999 forever. So, the, the, so there's actually this ambiguity in our own very familiar numbering system. And that's what's kind of going on here when these things get kind of close. They're kind of asymptoting to the same point, and there can be some finite to oneness, but in the asymptotic regime, we just ignore that. Okay. Right. Yes. Well, I guess I did write it down. Right. So, so, so the state space, when, when I just look at words of length L, that actually induces a partition of the state space corresponding to these cylinders. Okay. So that's now a bold, and I'm just doing that finite intersection you asked about. Right. So, or the other way to think about this more constructively is I just have the, um, I'm just, I start with that initial coarse partition, and I just iterate, again, thinking of the boundaries, backwards in time, backwards in time, backwards in time. And then that will be the set of these little cells. Each of which has its own code. Word code, word of length L, yeah. Why is it, it looks like you're looking only L many time steps yeah. backwards. Why, why is that? For, so look for like, this, this is like the pre-image of the word of length L. Right, so, so for us to, on the one hand, um, say that this coding scheme sort of really works and lets us capture properties about f, we have to talk about the infinite length sequence thing. But practically, we're always working with finite length words. So we're just kind of showing that the finite length words is a consistent okay. description here, a partition of the state space. Does L have to be very large? Depends on the question. Depends on the question. Yeah. We'll see some cases where um, it matters and some cases where it doesn't matter. And that is actually going to be one of the criteria for a good instrument. So, okay, so just to summarize, what we did is we took this possibly complicated, smooth function, whatever it is, sines, cosines, whatever, hypergeometric function, f, uh, on some mapping on some state space, and we replaced it with this utterly trivial shift map. The idea being that somehow, whatever the restrictions are and all the kind of convoluted iterates of f, those have been recoded into properties of these binary sequences, like no consecutive zeros or things like that. Restrictions on sequences of orbits turn, turn into forbidden words in this, in this symbolic representation. So we go from this infinitely precise point to infinite discrete sequences, and then you know, if we chose D well, the, the partitioning of the state space well, then we get to study the discrete sequences. And as we're going to see for a lot of the rest of the course, this is a huge win. Because there are things we can actually calculate there that we wouldn't know how to calculate if we were up here working with arbitrary smooth dynamical systems. So in fact, this technique was developed in the 1920s to do exactly that, to look at some of these deterministic chaotic systems um, and try to calculate how random they were, how chaotic they were. It was done through the symbolic dynamics methods because people didn't know how to do it on um, continuous dynamical systems. They didn't have computers that would let them calculate the Lyapunov exponents, to put it crudely. <laughs> so now we have that geometric method. So that's one thing we can, you know, the Lyapunov exponents calculating this sort of averaged instability and stability. Um, but before that point, you had to find, and the art of analyzing these dynamical systems for their degree of chaos was trying to come up with good partitions that gave you nice summaries of compact summaries of what the chaotic behavior was. And if it's very compact, maybe you can calculate something from it directly. So in, just to <clears throat> say what the punchline is, the previous two lectures we were talking about discrete stochastic process, discrete time, discrete symbol stochastic processes, and various kinds of models.
fair coin, IID, R block, Markov, R, order R Markov, and so on. Unifeeler, finite state Markov chain, so on. Um, we're going to use those different models to characterize as ways of representing the rules behind the restrictions in the symbol sequences and use those models actually to calculate properties of the original dynamical system. Okay, so let's, I'm going to come back to that construction we did and hopefully it'll be uh, one step less obscure. Just going to now talk about one dimensional maps, just easier to visualize what's going on. So, and also just with two monotone pieces in the language of the kind of one dimensional map world, we call those laps. I'm going to choose a, an instrument that just outputs binary symbols and then add a decision point D. And we can think of that actually as something we can vary across the interval. A priori, we don't know where it should be. Um, you could stick it someplace and then generate a bunch of 0, 1 sequences and then see how well they coded for the iterates x1, x2, x3. But I'll give you uh, two different kinds of instruments, two ways of characterizing where you should put D. Okay, so again, I'm just kind of rewriting the more formal stuff for this case of two lap one dimensional maps. There's the sort of L cylinder induced partition. Again, these little pieces, it's just the, and these are the divider between the cells um, of, of initial conditions that generate sequences. D inverse iterate of that right, for, the, for a uh, two lap map, typically there'll be two inverse iterates and so on. So those are all the, the divider points. And you can even uh, think about giving each sort of initial condition on the interval a kind of coordinate based on what its symbol sequence is. So you can even metrize this. We're not going to use that. So, okay, now, back to this again. So, logistic map, mapping the interval to itself, and our binary measuring instrument, and again, I'm choosing D right underneath a half, I'm right underneath the maximum, which is x equal half. So then, we ask where, what sub-intervals, the, the, the delta of S, uh, produced 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. And in this case, all of these length two words occur. They needn't all occur. Um, and we can see now, so I started with <clears throat> the sort of, what I'm showing down here with these ticks marked are the two cylinder induced partition of the interval that has four elements. So I'm taking the refinement of the first partition and then the other partition of these two elements here then refining them, and I just basically get the intersection, which means I just carry forward the boundaries. And then finally, the three sequences, and a refined partition. Again, the important thing is that all these partition elements are shrinking. So here's the, the, the kind of interesting puzzle. Because the system is chaotic, it's expanding in forward time, which means in reverse time it's contracting. Right? And calculating the partition dividers, essentially determining the size of the refined partition cells by looking at the inverse images of D, the decision point. The very fact that this is expanding in forward time means that, that this calculation going in reverse time, the cells are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So there are different ways to see this, like it's possible to over-explain this construction, but that's another interpretation of what's going on here. It's because the system is chaotic <laughs> that these encodings can be good. Slightly strange. But because the system is unpredictable and chaotic and has complicated orbit sets, I can actually use very simple encodings, or encodings over simple alphabets, to capture the properties. It's very handy. Well. To emphasize this point about uh, faithfulness of the encoding, so, so we have this question, when are these partitions good? At this point, it's been kind of a, a, our choice, which partition we take. The examples I gave you were, happened to be good, 
Um, but you could choose D to be some other value than a half for the logistic map. And it's an interesting question. What, if anything, the binary sequences coming out tell you about? Or maybe, in fact, a bad partition has actually added something to the system. It appears to be more st structured or more chaotic. So is that possible? So, Okay, so the goal here is we want, we, we need to be more precise about what this, this um, criterion goodness is for partitions. We want the symbol sequences to encode the orbits. And hopefully that would be one-to-one, -one. Uh, the mapping between. Um, so, so diagrammatically, we have this transformation of the state space to itself. That's the original dynamical system. And now we've constructed these various functions formally, the projection operator. So we have this system that's iterating the continuous states repeatedly. And what we've constructed is this so-called commutating diagram where, oh, I've got an x value, current state. I can look at the orbit that generates and then find the uh, uh, corresponding uh, sequence in the space of binary sequences, say. I do the trivial shift dynamic. I get a new sequence with basically the time origin binary point just shifted over one. And then using this projection operator, and this is why it's called a projection operator, is this particular link, I can look up what state that new sequence corresponded to. So at the most general level, we want this diagram to commute that either I can operate with a dynamic on the state space, or I can go through this other path of state to corresponding infinite sequence, shift it trivially, and then look back up with that new sequence, what state that corresponds to. Or this. In other words, the action of the dynamic on the original state space is equivalent to this. I go from the state, look up the sequence, shift the sequence trivially, and then map that sequence back onto a state in, the, in M. Um, wouldn't, doesn't this, if the diagram commutes, doesn't that require the T be invertible? Because sigma's invertible, right? Um, no, that's okay. Um, but so I mean, in the case where we have right. a, a map T that's many to one, right? Like the logistic map is an example yeah, sure, of that, right? Yeah, yeah logistic, right? Two right. There, there are two things can go like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in that case, what would did the projection operator not be invertible then, or? Oh, okay. Sigma is always going to be bijective, right? Okay, right. Yeah. So, so this isn't necessarily delta. Yeah, it's not. This is okay, this is okay. where it goes. This, remember, in fact, just as we were calculating for the logistic map f of d, we had multiple right. pre-images of that. So that's where we're sort. That's where the information is being maintained about the possible non-invertibility of t. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, now there are certain things. We're, we're sort of throwing away with this. This is what you would call a very topological view. We're just sort of tracking orbits. So for example, just to kind of give a hint of this, um, there is, uh, you know, the tent map is different from the logistic map because there's some curvature there. This really doesn't distinguish between the, the curving or piecewise linearity of those two maps. So there is some information on the interval we're throwing away. But for some quantities, and the question will be what, uh, that you can calculate this way. Like, for example, how much information is produced per unit time. The metric entropy, or entropy rate, that I already introduced and said we would get back to. So this is one of the things we can still calculate using the symbol sequences, and sometimes very straightforwardly. Okay, so, so um, but we're presented with this problem, the design problem. I've got a system, I want to discretize it somehow. Uh, what's the best way to do that such that the encoding is faithful? So there are two classes of partition. Um, one very nice, it's called a Markov partition, and that should kind of sound familiar. What this is going to do is actually induce a Markov chain on the system, and we know how to calculate everything for Markov chains. Uh, and then generating our partitions, which are a little less demanding, in some sense easier to find. Um, um, and a little, little harder to work with, but interesting, and in capturing pretty much everything still. Okay. So let's talk first about Markov partitions. So now um, we're just going to think about uh, a sequence space. Um, 
And the idea here is that a Markov partition induces symbol sequences that can be described by a Markov chain. So remember what a Markov chain was? We had general Markov processes, but Markov chain, discrete symbol. The Markovian property is that the future only depends on the previous symbol. Right? There was only a one-step history dependence. And obviously, if we can find these, that's great because it's going to be, I guess, a more compact model. So how are we going to do this? this? This is kind of the, we want the, we, we put this discretization down on the continuous state space and we have this, this discrete set of symbols coming out and we like that stochastic process to be one of these simple Markov chains. So now the question is, take that property back to the original continuous state space and see if we can come up with some criteria for that. So again, we'll just, the constructions are just easier uh, for maps of the interval. Um, we'll have some partition, some number of elements, some, some alphabet size. Uh, and then basically rather than thinking of the intervals themselves, we'll just think about the, their, their boundaries, their decision points between them. Okay. But still this has to be, these cells have to be a partition of the state space. Cover the whole space and not overlap. Okay, <clears throat> so, so here's, here's the definition, and we'll have to see how it works. So we say this choice of a partition of the space is a Markov partition for some function f. When I apply f to the whole set, or you can think of the boundaries, but to the whole set, and the resulting set in the range of f is exactly the union of other partition elements. Examples will come, but that's the definition. Okay. Moreover, that f restricted to each cell is basically a monotone function, one-to-one -one monotone. So here's an example, just to kind of drive this home. So here, I'm kind of dropping off some of the notation. So here's the domain of f, the range of f. There's f in green here, and I made just a real simple example where we have four partition elements. You know, they don't overlap, their union is the full interval, and here is f. So now, the first criteria was, I take f and apply it to this first cell, and that maps to p1, p2, and p3. Exactly. p2 maps to p3, p3 maps to p3 and p4, and p4 maps actually to the, all of them. Exactly. So I just wrote that out here. That f of p1, f of p1, is the union of P1, P2, P3, and so on. So that's the first step. And then you also have to go here and say, ah, basically I have within the cell, I have a one-to-one -one mapping restricted to the cell. So F restricted to the cell is some monotone function. It can't wiggle inside of here. Well, it can't wiggle too badly. It can't, for example, turn around itself. By way of contrast, here's an example, just slightly different, that is not a Markov partition. Why? Well, okay, p one's still fine, but the problem is P2 maps to just part of P3, right? Just, so F of P2 isn't some exact union of the others. Same thing with P3. P3, although it spreads all over P4, only captures part of P3. So no good. And the claim is that these will be bad encodings of some initial condition iterated under that map. That you're throwing some information away. So Markovian is that somehow the state space coarse grained really does look like kind of a Markov chain. It's discrete states that are mapping into each other cleanly. So in uh, this particular case, if you go through and kind of summarize this, uh, you can write down a uh, label, uh, sorry, a directed graph like this, right? Let's see, uh, P2 went to itself and uh, P1 went to itself, P2 and P3. So I have transitions like that. Uh, P4 went to itself, P3, P2 and P1 over the whole interval and so on. So I've just sort of summarized the sort of uh, state being in one of the intervals is just a blob here as if it was our Markov chain state and then wrote down all the possible transitions. So we won't prove this, but if you have, if you satisfy those 
you have a partition that satisfies those criteria, then you can show that the longer the sequences are in this encoding, the smaller and smaller the interval of initial conditions. And therefore, in the limit, you have this nice mapping between the, the encoded sequences and the original orbits. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity, so I don't want to go into too many technical details. Um, for example, um, when you choose states arbitrarily close to the partition boundaries, there can be some ambiguities that are sort of like, well, we have, think of real numbers. If I tell you the number one, you have a, an idea in your head. In fact, when I write down a binary or decimal expansion of that, I have two names, two encodings for the number one. 1.000000 or 0 0.99999. Right, so I change representation and there's a little bit, it's, this isn't too bad, right? It's, I just have two. So there, there are some encoding ambiguities like that, but those are sort of finite to one and we're not going to worry about them for most of the quantitative properties that we're going to capture. This kind of diagram here, the properties we calculate from it will capture sort of the sort of statistically sort of robust properties of the system. Okay. And again, you can show that Markov partitions satisfy this property. When we look at longer sequences, the set of initial conditions get smaller and smaller and smaller. Or the other way to say that is basically the refined partition, the cells get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it basically leads to that definition of Markov partition. So, um, so th this is very handy. We've gone from system over real numbers to a four-state system, and we can calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors and do all sorts of things, just like that. And because it's a good representation, then properties we calculate are properties of the original dynamical system. So let's go through our prototype 1D maps here, just to kind of think this through. Um, shift map. Okay, so here's the shift map. Remember, it's uh, x n plus 1 is 2 times x n mod 1. It has these two monotone pieces. The slope is 2 everywhere. <clears throat> so a Markov partition for this dynamical system is to put the decision point at a half. Okay, so now we, there, we have criteria we're supposed to test, right? We hypothesize this, um, call them label as cells, heads and tails. So we can look at the iterate of the T labeled partition, which is this. This thing iterates up actually across the full interval, so it captures both PT and PH. So F of PT is the union of those two things. And across this whole thing, obviously the function is a one-to-one -one monotonic well-behaved. And then same thing for the cell labeled H, labeled heads. It spans the whole thing and is monotonic. So, so there. So we verified that it is, this is a Markov partition, and now we have this two-state Markov chain over that, um, for that dynamical system. Heads can go to heads, heads can go to tails, tails can go to tails, tails can go to heads. In other words, all head-tail sequences get produced. Yeah? So, I don't know, along those lines, we need, we need these complete unions, so mm -hmm. like the logistic map, you can't do better than, so if you increase your resolution on your logistic map, so you can get four bins, ah. you would lose your, your your unions. Well, you still don't, you, you can propose a, a, a four, element partition for the logistic map, that's fine, but you still have to go back and verify these. So there are four element partitions of the... Right, the not four. Uniform. Space. Exactly. So, so say, right. uh, so you're, you're one, you're like two even right. in space, say I buy my fancy right. instrument, it gives me a million bins. Excellent, yes. I do worse. Right. Yeah. Okay, so... In, in some ways, in some ways I, I do yeah. worse. Right. No, that's, that's an excellent question, yeah. Well, worse, I mean, we, you should study that, but I, th I think at, at, at this point you should be highly suspicious of all the analog to digital converters you've ever bought. Or the way to think about it, maybe instead of you know buying the really expensive 24-bit converter, you could have bought a 10-bit converter if you could design in what the cell sizes should be in the thresholds. So, um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about bad partitions. I mean, first, what's good, <laughs> what we get out of it. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about when how things can go bad, and they can go really bad, which makes you should make you really suspicious about using 
uniform cell measuring instruments for chaotic systems. But let's just finish up the uh, examples here, just to kind of drive the stuff home. Okay, a uh, tent map, a logistic map. Again, the argument's sort of the same, even, you know, uh, similar to the shift map. I'm going to put my decision point at a half for both. You know, what I'm doing here is I'm looking where the maximum is, and then that's where I put my decision point. Um, and again, you can go through f of a maps to both, f of b maps to both. Um, same thing. Uh, monotone over each one of those things, and so on. It's essentially the same argument as with the shift map, which tells you a little bit about some of the information that could be thrown away. Namely, um, right, the shift map had two, piece, two monotone pieces that had positive slope, tent map has a negative piece. Um, you have to look a little more carefully um, in, in the encoding I just mentioned, the non-monotonic uh, ordering of the, of the words that you get out. It tells you a little bit of that, but you have to look a little harder for some of that information. Um, and here, these things are, well, positive, negative slope, that part is going to be the same here. They, they have very much the same sim symbolic dynamics. And they're also summarized by the same two-state two Markov chain. All AB sequences can occur. So this is like the fair coin process, right? So both the shift map, tent map, and logistic map, when they go all the way up to the top of the interval, they take the full interval onto itself, they're essentially a fair coin process. Okay, now here's a little less uh, trivial one, although a, a bit concocted. Um, I talked before uh, about the golden mean process, no consecutive zeros. Well, here's a one-dimensional map that produces that as a symbolic output. Okay, so, uh, well, here. Um, mapping the interval to itself, the green is F. Um, it's like the tent map, except that I have the... Uh, this is value B here, um, which is the decision point I'm going to use. That's where the maximum is. And uh, here's the, the, the map when X is less than B. I have that linear piece with positive slope. The slope is phi. Phi is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, which is the golden mean, hence the name. Uh, and then B, there's a little bit of algebra to calculate where the decision point should be to get this to fit on the interval. It's 1 over 1 plus phi. Okay, and then this is the, the negative slope region. Um, so, what I'm going to do is have a, this binary partition, x less than b, it outputs b, x greater than little b, it outputs capital A. But again, it's, it's easy to verify, right? f of big B maps all the way onto A, f of A maps across the whole interval, and therefore A, big A, and big B partition elements. And it's F is monotone over each one of those partition elements. So we've done our Markov chain verification. And so then we can write down what the possible states are, A and B, and then what the transition structure is. Right? A can go to itself or to B. A can go to itself or to B. And then B always goes to A. B always goes to A. So here's a one-dimensional dynamical system that produces that golden mean binary process. This, this, this is the no consecutive Bs process, or no consecutive zeros, if you'd like to label it that way. Another example, uh, the tent map. So again, this is our bifurcation diagram, right, the tent map. Now we're varying the height. A equal 2, it goes fully 2 on to 1. And then at a, a, just a little bit above 1, it punctures just above the, uh, the identity of the map. And we have these tiny little bands, two bands merging to 1, and then we have one full band here. So let's look at this A value. This is uh, square root of 2. And where we have these two bands that merge together there. We saw the, the, the probability distribution, right, have these two pieces, and they sort of map into each other, 
this, this value here is that unstable period one orbit. This piece maps to this piece. This piece maps this piece. So it's kind of a noisy period two process. Uh, what about a Markov partition for this? Okay. So the first thing you have to do is figure out what the boundaries of the attractor are. So, so we're looking at this invariant set. Uh, it turns out the, the upper bound on the attractor is just what the height is, right? If I'm, no matter where I start at the interval, I can't, after the first iterate, getting larger than this. So f of a half here is the upper bound on the attractor. And the lower bound is, is f of that again, which turns out to be heated down here. Right? If you think about, there's this upper bound here, and it's just a, nothing can be, no iterate can be larger than the maximum of the map. And then this boundary maps down to this boundary in the next iterate. And then if you remember with the criteria for band merging, then, so we have f of a half, f squared of a half, f cubed, f to the fourth of a half, and so on. They all land on here. This is a, a period one orbit, but it's unstable. So the iterates of a half become period one. And that is a criteria for the, the, the two bands merge. So that gives us a hint about where we should be putting these partition dividers. Um, we have to kind of scratch your head a little bit and think, think about this. Um, but once you get the hang of the construction, how the partition boundaries have to map into each other, it's not too hard in this case. So, so the proposed partition is this. So this is the attractor. And I'm going to break it into three pieces. Um, I break it into uh, a piece A that maps up to C, and a piece B that maps up to C, and a piece C partition that maps over A and B. And we can go through the, the checking we have to do. So F of C. Well, that maps exactly onto the union of A and B, and it's a straight map there, so it's monotone. F of B is just mapped exactly onto C, and F of A maps exactly onto C. So there we go. Now, what are the, what are the allowed transitions? Well, by these three now states of the Markov chain, C can basically go to either of these. But if I'm in state A or B, they always go back to C. So there's just a little bit sort of uncertainty here. Um, as soon as I'm in A or B, it's, it's predictable I'm going back to C. So that's kind of the period tuness. Every other time, I'm uncertain about what state I'm going to go to. OK, well, actually, that was it. I guess I must have gone fast. <laughs> So any questions about this? We'll, we'll do some, some more examples and talk a little bit about how things can go wrong. In particular, the, the, the Markov criteria is very strict. Right? It's, it's exact mapping of the boundaries, partition cell boundaries onto themselves. And that can be hard to find. So we need to relax that a bit. So next lecture, we'll talk about these generating partitions, which are much, much easier to, to identify. But they still have this property that long sequences identify smaller and smaller intervals and initial conditions that could have produced them.